Hello, Soft Strong Nation. Joe Simons, like times we are back again. This is going to be a really exciting when we have our fellow fishing coach, Captain Peter Deeks. What's up, What's dude? Up, guys? How are you? Man, for those of you listening, Deeks has got what looks to be an entire table covered with line lures, jig heads, and this massive salt strung flag. You probably have how many fishing rods behind you? 54? 55 just based on <laughs> amazing amazing luke he's got you beat dude yeah by a, by a long shot so i've got some work to do <laughs> <laughs> and so we've got luke as you heard his voice if you're listening to the podcast and we got justin Ritchie, who's also caught a lot of trophy fish and uh including last week dude killer um uh, grouper and snapper on uh and jigging there that was nuts yeah but, it's uh it's a lot a lot that goes into it and that's that's exactly what we're going to be diving into here is kind of the little bit of the secrets and kind of the big picture of what separates going out and just having a day of fishing and going and like so we're going to talk about hunting for the big ones for the trophies yeah so, and, and so of some of this will be quote unquote advanced tactics um you know justin and i chatted offline i mean this this is this is something that, that builds over time just like we get made the comparison of me you know trying to look like tony versus my dad bod uh i i could certainly do it i think uh but it would take some time right it's it just like becoming uh an experienced guy like peter deeks it didn't happen overnight but but there are some shortcuts and there are some things that you should know to pay attention to and it and, and I use the analogy kind of like hunting. We have a cousin named Josh who's very big into hunting and fishing. And you know, hunters, as you know, I mean, they can't go hunting for deer like we can a redfish all year long. And so, you know, my cousin Josh, I mean, he's putting trail cams out. I mean, he's going in the back and forth of the hunt camp. It's like a six-hour drive uh, every weekend up until then. He's like in forums. He's like part of an insider club like we are for hunting. I mean, he's putting in so much time pre-trip planning time before he gets that one shot potentially at, at a trophy, uh, at a trophy buck. And so it's very similar to, to going after trophy, whether it be your personal best or even a state record, which or world record, which Deeks has quite a few on his boat. It, it's a little bit different. And there's a lot of pre-trip planning. There's this understanding the biology of the fish or the deer, or the elk or whatever is you're going after. And it's, it's not just some crap shoot where you go to the same old spot or the, the spot, someone that, you stole their spot off Instagram or, Oh yeah. So-and-so at the bait store told me to go around here. It, it's, it's not that simple, but then again, it's not that hard when you have a good strategy. So we asked Deeks to come on to kind of share his process and, and how he thinks through that. And if you don't know, Deeks is one of those few guides that he doesn't put in at the same ramp every day. He's not at the same arena, like many guides. There's nothing against that. I mean, he, he chases the trophy fish around all over the place, sometimes out of state, uh, and so he has it dialed in more than anyone I've ever met. And so we couldn't think of a, of a better guest to bring on. So with that, Captain Peter Deeks, where do you want to start? Do we want to talk about your pre-trip planning? Like what goes in your head, the biology of, of these fish, in particular redfish, snook, and, and big old gator trout? Uh, where, 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 what do you think is the most important piece of it all? Um, yeah, let's start there with the pre-trip planning, but let's first kind of picture what a trophy fish is. A trophy fish is a size of a certain species that's larger than most everybody else catches, right? Like a trophy trout's much smaller than a trophy sized snook. So a fish that's bigger than other people can catch is a fish that's smarter. It either lives in an area that other people can't get to, or it lives in an environment that allows it to decipher whether or not that's a, a a bait, a food fish that it can eat that doesn't have a hook in it, or if it's somebody trying to catch them. Um, so when you do your pre-trip planning, you want to you want to first think of where you're going to fish. So it helps to pull up. Like if you're not familiar with an area, let me back up a little bit. If you're going after trophy fish for the first time, even if you're familiar with an area, maybe pull up like a Google Earth map so you've got a satellite image. And you're going to look at some, some areas that you think trophy fish might live in. A good place to start would be, I've noticed that, that the bigger fish, redfish, snook, and trout, they tend to be in areas where there's fish of that species, 
but the larger fish are going to be just on the outside. And I don't know if you guys have noticed that as well, but if you've got a grass flat that has a lot of big trout or just a lot of trout in general, the bigger ones are going to be right on the edge, the outside deeper edge of where those smaller trout are. And then same with redfish. If you find a bunch of redfish in a pass up on the rocks or what have you, the biggest ones are going to be just in the outside of that. So they're always kind of on the fringe. The bigger fish tend to be um, closest to the structure or out on the deeper side of where the, the numbers of fish are. So I found that with both snook, trout, and redfish. So if you've got an area that has a lot of fish, um, you look at the map and kind of find out an area that might be just a little bit deeper, just the outside of those fish, and that's where you want to target. So, so first, you want to plan your trip, pick a couple really good spots, focus on that. And next, you want to look at your tides. So for me in Florida, um, a backfilling tide is probably my favorite tide to fish for trophy fish. And that's where the water is still moving out, but the water level is coming up. So on the east coast of Florida, central east part of Florida, and it's different in the Gulf, but you can look at the tide charts. If it's low tide at, let's say, 9 a.m., you're going to have about two hours of a rising tide after nine while the water's still coming out. So if it says dead low at 9 a.m., you're gonna have two more hours of that water still flowing out the direction that it's been going all morning, but the water level is gonna be coming up. So lower water means the fish are more concentrated. They're not scattered out across the flat, but a rising water makes the fish more comfortable and that's when they're gonna feed the best. So all through incoming tide is one of my favorite times to catch big fish. They're not on guard, they're not nervous. A falling tide, when the water's dropping down, the fish get on edge, they're worried that they're gonna run out of water. The bigger fish are oftentimes the first to dump off the flat and get the channels. So if you're, if you're trying to pick the best time to target these trophy fish, that's my favorite time. Um, and pretty much dead low. Um, and then about six hours on the East Coast. And the West Coast, it varies day to day. So you have to watch your tide charts on that. Um, and then once you put together a pretty good strategy, you want to then focus on your rigs, your tackle, and your bait, which we can go into a little bit later if you guys have any, anything you want to throw in there. Yeah, that's uh, priceless on the tide part. So this question comes up a bunch, and you kind of answered it, but I don't know that this is – always the case 100 percent of the time i could be wrong but the question comes that hey i'm catching a bunch of dink trout not big ones dinks are, yeah. are there are there big gator trout around or am i in the wrong area so there's always going to be gator trout where there's a lot of dinks and because they feed on the dinks they like that environment but you're not going to find them in the middle of those dinks so if the dinks are in let's say four feet of water on a steady grass flat and potholes, you're going to find your bigger fish in the deeper potholes on the outside, or you might find them actually a little bit shallower up along the mangroves patrolling. And they might be a couple hundred yards from the dinks, but they're going to be in that area. And, and here's another thing to look for. If you're catching a bunch of dink trout, then look for the big stripe mullet. The big, the big mullet that you see jump and flop, um, they're going to be in the same water depth most of the time you're going to find a big trophy trout. Um, they do eat those big mullet and they also eat the smaller trout. So that's a, that'd be a pretty deadly combination. If you could find an area that had a bunch of dink trout and then you found where the big mullet were, fish where those big mullet are. And I can guarantee you there's big trout in that area. And speaking of records real quick, we just hit a new record for using the word dink the most times in any podcast. <laughs> this is almost episode 400. I think we just hit 11 dinks. It's a big day. Yeah. That's that's really big. Awesome news. Yeah, that 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 mullet the the mullet school is so so crucial, uh, particularly for for the big trout. Yeah, Peter nailed it. I'm I'm seeing the same thing. I you know I saw that 100 true over there at Indian River, and the exact same thing is happening over here in, in Tampa Bay and and down in in Charlotte Harbor too. So that's that's such an important tip that, that I overlooked for many years. Yeah, I I mean I've caught big trout on on you know 10, 12, 14 inch mullets, so I know they eat them. But they also like that environment. You know, you're pulling along in clean water, Luke. I know you've seen how many times you pull through a school of big mullet and then there'll be two or three just giant trout just sitting there swimming with them. Absolutely. 
Yeah, and I mean, Reds like too, right? Same with Reds and, and even Snook. Like a big mullet um, is, is something that I, I always pay attention to when I'm up in the shallows. Definitely a good key thing to look for, for sure. So um, what about redfish? Why we're on the same topic? So, hey, I'm catching a bunch of dink redfish or just, you know, smaller redfish if we want to keep using the word dink over and over again. Or we probably just should break an all-time record same thing or are they a little bit different than trout you know because i i don't i have we, we've even caught on camera a couple of times you know a trout with a, another trout in its mouth like a big trout with a 14 inch in its mouth don't see that as much with redfish uh what do you see there if you're in an area where you're catching a bunch of just smaller or barely slot reds are you going to have the bull reds around there or not the thing about redfish is this they're, they're very migratory when they get to like when they become sexually mature they form large schools and then they become very migratory. So you can always catch a random giant redfish just about anywhere. Um, but if you're going to focus on big redfish, normally you want to focus on them in the early spring or the fall. Um, that's when these big schools move in close to the, to the shore. So they'll come in the passes, they'll move into the river systems, whether you're from Virginia to Texas, this is the time of year when those really big fish for the most part everywhere move in close you're gonna, and you're going to find them in lots of different areas environments they're always moving so if you're in an area and you're catching lots of dink redfish you might catch a big one but probably not and um and so you really if you're going to focus on trophy redfish you want to focus on trophy redfish whereas like trout and snook you can catch both sizes in the same area redfish it's a little different it's a little more seasonal Cool. Super helpful. Uh, before we go on to kind of the next topic, I, I want to circle back on the pre-trip planning. Uh, assume we have someone who's, who's a, a decent angler, right? Who's caught yep. us inshore slam before they're familiar with their area, but they still haven't caught like an over, over slot, like a, like a large fish. Right. Um, and we hear that all the time. Like, yeah, man, I'm catching my slams. I, I feel like I'm, I'm getting confident, but I still can't get a big one. I still haven't got like a legit one that I'm proud of, you know, putting a picture and, and you know, I'm talking like a 40 inch snook or a red or a third, you know, not a 30. Cause that's, that's only people like Deeks that do that every day, but you know, 27 inch uh, inch speckled trout. Are you looking for certain structure going back to the, the satellite map? Are there certain things that you key in on and say, yeah, like there's got to be big bait there, you know, big bait for big fish. There's got to be, you know, a good uh, drop offs or, or the right amount of structure, the right kind of depth. Is there something you're, you're looking for and, and how does that change season to season? Um, so that's, so there's, there's a lot we can go on with that. Um, the first is, there's more large trophy fish where you're fishing than you think. So like what Luke was saying, you focus on those big stripe mullet for trout for, and for snook, let's say. Um, you want to now focus on your tactics and your baits to get those fish. Um, so it's not so much the location as it is the tactic to get those fish to bite. So if you're out there and you're catching a lot of 24-inch snook, it's probably your tactics that are keeping you from catching a 35 inch snow. That's good. Um, so, so they're in the 90 10 zone. They, they found the feeding area. They're just not using the right tactics and, and baits. Right. And it does help too, to go through with your trolling motor, your push pole or drift an area and look with your eyes. You know, you might scoop the fish out for the day, but you can come back. But if you're on a mangrove point and every time you fish and you catch four or five 22 inch snook, Maybe roll through one day and just look and see what's under there because maybe there's only 22 inch snook there. But more often than not, if you find an area that has those 22 inch snook and you also have this big low for mullet, there's big snook patrol in that area. I mean, it, you, there almost can't be, but there's lots of environments, right? You can eat big fish in and, and, uh, passes, you can catch them off the beaches, you can catch them on the flats, rocks, jetties. There's so many different environments. So it's hard to cover all of that. But when I'm focusing on trophy fish, I really focus on areas where I know there's fish and then I change my tactics. And that's what catches me bigger fish. So I, I kind of want to piggyback on that and, and throw like a little bit of a curveball or just kind of a circumstance for you. So for those that, that have a boat or have a way to get on the water and can patrol and scout and find these areas, that's one scenario. But you mentioned, you know, piers and jetties and areas where big fish are known to congregate, 
But let's say mm-hmm. somebody's going out and catching smaller snook or catching small dink. I'm sorry. The dink meter needs to keep there you tipping go. over. Mm-hmm. There we go. The dink meter is, is at max capacity right now. Um, <laughs> if you want to go for, you know, the bigger variety of these game fish and you're shore bound or fishing from land, you talk about the tactics. What would be an example of a tactic that would help someone increase their chances of catching a trophy size, let's say a redfish, okay? Because I mean, right now, like you mentioned, it would be a good time of the year to go for trophy redfish. They're migratory and they're very seasonal. We're in the season right now being in kind of the the peak of fall. Um, What would you do to help change your tactics from going from dink redfish to a 40 inch bull? Okay, no, that's a really good question. Um, So I'm a fishing guide. My job is to give people the best opportunity to catching big fish on their own on my boat. So I use bait. You can fool big fish with lures, but to fool the biggest, smartest fish, you can't go wrong with bait because that's what they're already feeding on, right? So if you're fishing from shore, you're already a little bit handicapped because you can't move around. You're stuck there. Um, It gives you an advantage, though, because you're on structure already. And so big fish want to be in that area more often than not. So you want to have a a good bait and you want it to be natural. So I'm going to just throw up right here. So we've got, I've got two baits here that are pretty common. So we've got a, got a big pogey and we've got a croaker. These are great redfish baits here. You can use crab. There's, you know, all sorts of different baits, but a big redfish, like, a. you know, do you have that on a dinner plate, by the way, is that just hanging out in your office? Cooking with Peter Deeks. This is something (laughs) That song's like diamond. <laughs> yeah. But a big redfish, you know, and you're fishing from shore, he's gonna be patrolling around. They're very scent oriented. They're almost like a catfish. So they're they're or a shark, making, you know, we don't want to humiliate them. Ooh. They're cruising around looking for scent. So if you get a nice pogey like this, or a mullet or any kind of cut bait, and you rig it properly, throw it on the bottom and let it sit, that is a great opportunity to catch big redfish. You throw out a shrimp, you're probably not going to get the big ones. You're going to get the dinks. You're going to get whiting. You can get other fish. But if you want big redfish, fish for them kind of like sharks. Um, and But one thing you want to keep in mind is you want them to look natural on the bottom. So if you're fishing in an area with a lot of current, right, current's ripping through, and you don't rig the baits properly, they're either not going to be on the bottom, which is where the big redfish are. When there's a lot of current, they're going to be glued to the bottom. So you got to get this bait to the bottom. And you don't want it to just perpetually spin. You want it to be streamlined. And that's how you rig these baits. So um, if you guys want, we can rig up a rig here real quick, and I'll talk you through it. So even fishing in dirty water or clean water, if you're fishing in shallow water flats, we're going to kind of lean towards a guy that's fishing off the jetty or a pier. So a lot of times that's going to be near an inlet, a pass, the mouth of Tampa Bay, an area like that where you're going to have a lot of tidal flow, not necessarily that strong. If it's just screaming out, wait till the tide slows to fish it. But if it's just, you know, a couple miles an hour, you're fine. So what I like to do, regardless of the water clarity, is I will get 30 or 40 pound um, fluorocarbon line. I like this Berkeley Vanish. You get a lot of, a lot of fluorocarbon for cheap. And, um, and if you're fishing for big ones, go 30 or 40 pound test. You don't need to go really light. And I like to put, if I'm going to use braided line, I'm going to do about, let's say, I don't know, six to eight feet of this. And then it's going to come to a weight. So let me read this here real quick. So for those listening, Deeks is um, got a couple of baits on a plate. On a plate, baby. <laughs> in his office. And he's rigging up Berkeley Vanish Fluoro uh, that you said 30 or 40 pounds. Yeah, because we're fishing for big redfish. Redfish don't depend on their eyes as much as they do uh, their nose, especially if you're using cut bait. Um, so use, use about eight feet of 30 pound. That way, because sometimes they'll come in in schools. So like a, a pack will swim by. So your bait's sitting on the bottom. We're rigging it with a weight here. And if you just run straight braid to two or three feet of leader, if the lead fish doesn't eat your bait and it swims into that line and it, and it spooks because it's Fish don't love braided lines. So when they see that braided line and it spooks off, the rest of the school is going to follow it. So I like to run a pretty long piece of 30 or 40 pound fluorocarbon. That way, if the lead fish swims by, it just keeps going until one of the fish finds the bait. So anyway, we're going to run that. We're going to put on a, um, you want to match the weight to the current. So this is an ounce and a half weight. You can get away with this in just about any environment. Very simple. If the current's stronger, use a heavier weight. 
If you need to use heavier than three ounces, you're probably in a little bit too strong of a current. So maybe look for an eddy, wait for the current to slow down a little bit. Um, so anyway, just tie a knot on here, like tie a blood knot. And walk through everyone, what, what, what are you tying right now? So I'm tying two feet of 50 pound fluorocarbon. So you got your, your main line, which is braid, mm -hmm. to eight feet of fluoro, 30 pound-ish, and then oh. a couple feet of 50 to 60? And then a, a, couple, a couple feet of 50. Okay. I don't love swivels, but you can use a swivel. Um, I also like to keep my weight um, free sliding here. It does two things. It helps you fight, uh, feel the bite better. And also if you break the fish off, the fish isn't going to drag this weight around. So just thinking ahead, um, if this line were to break, the weak joint is going to be this knot here with this 30 pound to 50 pound. If it snaps there, worst case scenario, then once that hook rusts out of the fish, uh, he's good to go. But, you know, I hate the thought of having like you put two swivels on here or something. Oftentimes that weight will be dragging behind the fish for a long time. It's kind of a bummer. So anyway, we're going to put a circle hook on here. And, and for those who aren't listening or for those who aren't watching or just listening, he's uh, he's basically doing the, the back end, which I started doing after after seeing his course that we did a couple years ago. It's basically it's basically beefing up the business end. So like right in front of the fish, right where the fish's mouth is going to be rubbing on the on it on its teeth and everything or when the fish is is getting down on the bottom that that last like really foot uh, of line plus or minus is what's most likely going to get. Uh, the most abrasion and so he he does a relatively light leader and then beefs up that back section which i, th I think is a great idea I, I use it for lures as well and it uh it helps increase performance while having the the ability to not get broken off by those big ones yeah i, yeah. I have point. a question for you peter real quick is i mean i'm watching it happen right now but visually yeah. i'm trying to see it you've got braided line which you have a line to line connection to a long section of leader Mm -hmm. And then you have another line to line connection to a shorter section of leader. Where is that sinker placement? So the sinker placement is, is so let's start at the hook. So we've got the hook. We've got two feet of 50 pound fluorocarbon. We've got a knot that's joining that 50 pound to 30 pound. And that's where the weight is. So the weight is landing on that knot. So the weight when the bait is on the bottom is going to be about two feet from your bait. Got it. Okay. That's cool. I, I've actually never done that rig. This is, that that's, makes so much sense, especially with the whole, like, if you break off, because it happens, not dragging around the weight too, but the beefing up at the business end, that's different. I've never, we've, we, we've talked about this on another call, but to see it in application and know that you do that, that's really cool. Cool. Yeah, it's super handy. And, and the big redfish, you know, you get a 30, 40 pound redfish on there, especially if you're fighting up. So if you're on a bridge, his front teeth, they're not cutting teeth, but they all they will like bite into the line. So if you're running straight 30 and you're fighting up on that fish, after a while of him sawing back and forth, he will break through that line. So, you know, redfish aren't known for biting through heavy line, but you know, you do want to put at least a good shot of 50 on there ahead of your hook to keep them from biting through. And um, and also too, everything needs a cut bait. So you might get a tarpon, you might get a snook. And now that you got 50 pound on here in a circle hook, whatever bites, you got a good chance of catching. Um, and so here, and so whether you're fishing in current or no current, uh, this is a great rig for giant redfish, wherever you fish. Um, and then I'll just show you on the, on the, uh, the fish here real quick. We're going to get a little messy. And real quick, Peter, with you've had how many different world records caught off your boat now? Um, I've had quite a few. Some have been a lot of them have been broken over the years. Um, but the one that I'm most proud of is that big trout. That might stand forever, maybe. That was okay. a cool fit. So and with with all of them, uh, regardless if they're still standing or broken, what do you know the percentage that were caught on live bait versus cut bait? Um. So there was a while where I was getting a lot of line classes and length records for redfish, and those were all on cut bait. Um, but I would say that probably all the others were on live bait. Okay. But um, but yeah, this is just a quick one on redfish. We can go into snook and trout a little bit more. But here's your pogey. If you, if you can't see, I had about an eight inch pogey manhaden. It's a common bait. Get him just about anywhere you can do this with a pinfish. Cut off the back quarter of him. 
and you want to hook it bottom to top, right through the end of the nose like this. And that's going to keep it very streamlined in the water to keep it from spinning. It'll spin a little bit on the way down, but once it gets down on the bottom, the weight's going to hold it. And then the current's going to force it down. We do that cool uh, underwater live bait course. You can see it in person, but it drags that bait down to the bottom and then it'll get down there and it'll just sit there. And so wherever that current goes, it's going to drag the scent. It's going to attract the big red fish. So if you're fishing from shore, fire one or two of these out there with a circle hook. If there's big red fish in the area, you will catch them. So super simple and it's very effective. And this is what I use when I'm fishing from the boat, but it works really good from shore as well. At what point do you spray the Dr. Juice on that cut bait? Well, that's a secret that I don't talk about too much. But <laughs> the I juice got, is loose. Not to go somewhere else with this conversation, but I got my boat not too long ago. And he was mad I didn't have WD-40 on the boat to spray on his baits. And I was like, he's serious? And he's like, he got mad at me. I was like, <laughs> well, no, I guess. <laughs> we got something but, way better way better than wd-40 love it did justin did that answer your question for the viewers you think it did thank you man that's okay. i mean I, i'm learning something new in this too like it, this is awesome cool let's well, i've got all this mess in front of me here um let's go into into rigging for the flats when you're focusing more so this is the the tackle end of targeting big snook and big trout on the flats and then we'll go we'll go into a little bit more of the fishing technique for them but since i've got the rigs out here so you want to do the same thing that we did here uh, for the redfish and you just want to make it a little bit different so you're going to use your braided line and what i like to use is i like to use 20 pound braided line and I like to use a size like 3,500 spinning reel. Two reasons, it allows you to cast really far. And when you hook a really big snook, like a 45 inch fish, like we caught uh, not too long ago, it's gonna burn down some drag. And if you have a smaller reel, like a 2,500, you might run out of line, especially if you're fishing from shore. So if you can, if you can use a 3,500, but 20 pound test, you can even go as high as 30 pound test. Um, that's what I use day to day to catch big fish on the flats in shallow water. And that's where you're going to find a lot of your big snook and a lot of your really big trout. Um, so what I like to do, since the fish are afraid of your braided line, I'm going to use 20 pounds. So this is 20 pound fluorocarbon um, by the line. Like, you know, there's a lot of different brands, but by the line, not the leader. It's clear. It's true fluorocarbon. It's soft and it's it's much more affordable. So. I like to put about 10 feet um, of the 20 pound attached to my braided line. So I'm going braided line, 10 feet of this, and I'm gonna go 10 inches of 50 pound fluorocarbon. And then I'm gonna use, I like to use J hooks with live bait. So when I'm targeting the big snook and the big trout, I like to use live bait and I like to use a J hook. You're gonna feel the bite and set the hook. Uh, a lot of these bigger fish, if let's just, you know, cause a lot of people say, well, I'm going to throw it out there. I may not feel the bite. If a big fish bites your bait and you don't set the hook, he's going to spit it out. He's not going to sit there and swallow it and swim around. Snook and trout, they're going to eat it. They're going to munch on it for a second. And then they're going to spit it out if you don't set the hook. Two hooks I really like. I like these Gamakatsu 7 knot octopus hooks. They're a little heavy. So if you're using a smaller bait, the bait's not going to swim as natural. If you're using a smaller bait, I like these stinger hooks. This is a Gamakatsu stinger. They're called a B10S. This is a fly fishing hook. It's very thin wire. I'm going to pull it out so everybody that's watching this, they can see. But when you're fishing light tackle, it's really hard to get a good hook set sometimes on these bigger fish. And this very thin wire, it's, it takes a very little hook set to get that in the fish. And I rarely, if ever, gut hook a fish. This hooks them right in the corner of the mouth. It's an interesting bend. Check it out. Uh, you might have to order them online or go to your fly shop. It's called a B10S Stinger. It's light. So it's a, this is a, um, a three-aught hook, but the weight of this hook is much less than a three-aught of an octopus hook. So you could put this behind a big white bait or whatever bait you're going to fish, and it's going to look more natural. And so... That's what I like to do. So I'm going to run my braided line. I'm going to use about 10 feet of 20 pound. I've got a short piece of 50. If you keep it about 10 or 12 inches long, the big fish won't be deterred from it. So you're going to catch your big trout. So if you're fishing for big trout exclusively, keep that 50 pound shot on there. Even though the trout won't bite through the 20, 
if that giant snook bites it or if a big redfish bites it or a cobia bites it, now you can catch that fish and it's not going to deter your trout strikes. So it's super simple. And um, that's the rig that I use almost every day on my flats fishing charters because you never know when that new world record is going to bite. And that's going to allow you to catch just about everything and it's going to keep your bait looking natural. So I think that covers everything that I do rig wise to catch those big fish. Love it, man. So what are... What are some other tactics? And I, I'll kind of give you a lead. Uh, yeah. You kind of touched on it. You know, we've been fishing with you a lot. We've caught some monster fish. You referenced that one. I, I caught a, a little over a 40 inch snook thinking that was going to be the best of the day. And then Luke, it's like a 45 in my face uh, right there in the flats. And we were in a few feet of water. And what's interesting is you're right. We, we both were using J hooks. I'm pretty certain and, mm -hmm. and we have most of the time with you and I've never seen one that's, you know, way down its, its throat. And um, what's different about fishing with Deeks versus what a lot of people think about cut bait fishing, where you put it in the rod holder and you let the rod do all the work and you're having, sitting there having a beer and you miss a bunch of strikes. I mean, it's, it's active live bait fishing. We did a whole course on it. If you guys haven't seen that, that original course, I mean, that was one of our most popular courses ever because so many people had that aha moment, like, holy smokes, if I want to catch more and bigger inshore fish with live bait, I need to have the rod in my hand. And you're almost, I mean, you're letting line out. A lot of times you get the spool open and, and you're feeling it, almost fishing it kind of like an artificial lure. Uh, so kind of talk about that and maybe some other tactics that, that you, you use and that you see a lot of people doing incorrectly when they come on your boat for the first time. Okay, so this is probably the most important thing that you can do when you're trying to get the big fish to eat your bait. So we're going to focus on bait here. Um, there's two things that you, this needs to be very important to you when you're targeting big fish. So you're in the area and you have the area that you want to fish. You need to make sure that you get your bait out there in a way that the big fish doesn't know how it got there. So you're either gonna make a really long cast when it lands, the big fish in the area are either gonna spook out or they're gonna see it and not eat it. At that point, you now have to sit back, stay very quiet and you have to wait for that fish or a new fish, not that fish, a new fish to patrol along and find your bait. The fish that saw you make that cast, the reason why that fish is a trophy is because he's not going to eat your bait if he saw you make that cast. He knows how it got there. So you have to just be patient for a new fish to come along. That's a good way to do it, um, especially for really big snook. If, if like you're, you're in an environment where you got a bunch of dinky trout on the outside and you got a bunch of dinky snook against the mangroves and you got a bunch of giant mullet like in between them and you put a big bait in the middle of those mullet, just sit back, relax with the right rig, be quiet, and let those fish come to you. Um, if you're a little more impatient like I am, um, which you can't be when you're big fishing, then you drift the baits through the zone and you're gonna, you're gonna cut that gap. So you're gonna get that bite that much sooner. So I like to fish up current, drift the baits down current to the fish through the strike zone. And, um, and that's what we do a lot when we're fishing together. But that way the bait is swimming natural, we're using light line, um, we're not putting much resistance on it. And when the bait shows up in front of the fish's face, he doesn't know how it got there and it looks really natural. And the second thing is that bait has to swim the way that it swims when it doesn't have a hook. The big fish, oh, excuse me, they can tell. So if you're fishing a pig fish or a pin fish or a croaker, that's a bait that wants to be on the bottom you need to use a light enough hook that it swims on the bottom. If the current's heavy, you need to hook them in the nose, put a little weight on there to keep them on the bottom. Those fish are not going to eat those baits up off the bottom. You put a popping cork with a pig fish on it, you're going to catch a million trout, not going to catch that 30 incher. You might, but probably not. You want to keep that bait on the bottom. Mullet, they like to swim up on the surface. So, so free line that mullet, keep it up on the surface. Big fish are going to come up for that. So, you want to kind of know what those baits do in the wild without a hook and do everything in your ability to allow those baits to swim that way through those fish. And let me also make a very important point. Big, big fish 
snook, trout, and redfish, they're on the bottom. They're almost always on the bottom and they're smaller relatives. They're not always on the bottom. So in a few circumstances, you can find a big snook laid up under a dock. You might go through a marina, you know, you see a big snook sitting up there. But if you were to hop in the water, his big friends, they're all on the bottom. So to catch the big fish, I like to be on the bottom. So I like to use bottom baits and I like to use weights unless I'm fishing in really shallow water, you know, in like two to three feet of water, I'll use some mullet and some filters that are up top. But otherwise, you know, having a bait that's going to be down in its space by using a weight um, or finding a bait that naturally wants to be down there, like a mahar or a pinfish, pigfish, um, that's really important because a lot of people, I think, fish above where the big fish are and the big fish don't want to work. So they're not going to come racing up to eat a bait. They're going to patrol around it. They're going to look at it for a while. They may pass it and then five minutes later, circle back and come look at it again and then eat it. So you want it in the zone. You want it down there in their face and you, and you want to present it away to where they can't tell that there's a hook in it. That's awesome, man. Priceless. Um, I know you guys got to get on this other, uh, other call, uh, Luke and, uh, and Justin. So we'll definitely have to do a part two. Uh, the other thing I've noticed about you in particular is you spend a lot of time on the phone. I'm not talking about like, you know, looking at social media, uh, you have a network, right. And, and I fish with you all over the place. You, you'll even tell me like the day before Joe meet here. And it could be an hour from where we thought we were going to meet based on your pre-trip planning and your network is where I'm going with this. Uh, talk yeah. about that, the importance of having a network. And obviously we have our insider community in which you're part of, and it's all part of this network about being able to, to leverage other people and, and, and vice versa to help them out as well when they need it. Uh, but I see you do it all the time. So talk about that real quick. So no one wants to give away their secret spot. And, and even in your tightest net community, everybody's competitive. You don't want to give away your secret spot. But it's very important to have people that you trust that are good fishermen to give you a report on the, the habitat and the environment. Like, did red tide move into that basin? You know, if, if you're going to fish on Saturday or Friday, you can make a phone call to somebody that's close to you or you go online, send a message or read some reports. And it's important to have that tight knit community um, because let's say you put the boat in on Friday morning and you roll out there and there's a giant algae bloom and there's just nothing for miles. Um, and that happens. So with the water quality issues and stuff, that's really important. Uh, bait, uh, where the bait at? And the bait is, I, you know, I can't fish without proper bait. And people give that informa or information away to their friends, right? And so it's, it's crucial to know where the bait is, um, how the water is looking, what's the tide doing? You know, do we have a big tide last night? Do we have a big tide tomorrow? And that with having that, especially with your pre-trip planning, it allows you to come up with a very good game plan for your fishing trip. I love it, man. Uh, Luke, Justin, any other questions? I, I know you guys got a bolt before we uh, close yeah, it down. I'll just say that network part is the, is the one thing that I didn't really put a focus on for a long time, and that's my biggest regret. Um, and, and Peter, actually, it started when we started doing those tournaments uh, over there in, in Melbourne. And then you know, me and Nick basically befriended all, it was all of us non-guides against the guys. And so there was like four of us boats like that. We were just sharing information and we, we would all you know, go on the pre-trip. We, we all knew where we all fished. There wasn't any, any really secrets, right. but we would just share what, what was trending, like where those bigger fish were holding. And once we started doing that, that's really when, when my game just skyrocketed, that was the biggest impact that I, I used to do detailed historical look like tracking, tracking like year over year stuff that was helpful, but it was nothing compared to the real time human intelligence. So I, I just wanted to make sure that everybody listening, um, you know, was, you know, heard that, that part on, on just really how important the network is. It is. And start with having something to bring to the table, you know, like, you know, don't always be a taker, go out there and work really hard because I don't give information away that easy, but if I see the same guys out there day in and day out, day in and day out, they paid their dues and they deserve to know. And, and, you know, they'll give me a tip and it's like, man, you give me one tip, I'll give you 10 back. And so it's always helpful when joining a new group that, you know, you, you, you throw out some accurate information first. Yep. Completely agree. That's awesome, man. All right. So I know you're more of a live bait guy and we're talking about, you know, trophy fish, but if you don't yep. have one lure, just one to go out there and catch. Slim Shady, baby. Oh, 
<laughs> snatch. Not, but maybe. <laughs> Trophy fish feed on the bottom. And they don't like rattles. They don't like lures. They're going to stay away from lures. So what does a lure do? Like, lures are designed to make noise. They're designed to attract fish. They're shiny. They're loud. They move a lot. And so fish kind of now key away from that because they're used to seeing that. You go back 60 years and you throw in these loud lures, every fish in the whole river is going to race over and eat it. But now you're fishing against other anglers. You're not just fooling the fish. You're trying to fool the fish that was smarter than everybody else. And so the power prawn has become a really great bait. You can just slow roll it. I've got a half ounce jig head on here. And um, if I needed to go catch a giant snook or a giant trout tomorrow in the area that I fish where they're just so like overfished, this would be a lure that I would like. Now I do love the slam shady and I've caught, I've caught one of my biggest redfish which was in that one video. It's like yeah, 50, were, oh, we got was, a shady. He was so mad. He's like, I my friends can't see this that I caught a 50 inch redfish on slam shady. <laughs> and he, he whooped it. But, um, but yeah, you catch great fish in slam shady, but don't overlook the power prawn when you're looking for the, the next level size fish because everything loves the shrimp and just slow roll on the bottom, especially getting into fall. Winter time, snook and the redfish are going to be in the passes. It's just a really easy lure to fish. Fire it out there and, and reel it kind of steady like a shrimp. Shrimp doesn't jig that much. You just keep it right along the bottom. You're going to be where the fish are. And um, I think it'll give you the best chance of catching a big trophy fish. Peter, Love it, man. Peter's on it. I'll, I'll just add that final note, man. You're on it. Like less is more with the power prawn. My biggest red was like 43, 44 inches on the power prawn back in January. A and night. I yeah, it was just an absolute monster. So I would agree that's an underrated tool to slowly present. And it may seem like nothing, but when you're you know going after wigged out fish that have seen everything, less is more. I think that power prawn is a hot ticket for sure. Yeah, completely agree. Well, guys, if you want more of this, Captain Peter Deeks is one of our fishing coaches, has been for quite some time. And uh, please, please, please go over there. Check out his courses if you're a member. If you're not a member, what are you waiting on? Uh, come join us there today over there at saltstrong.com and the 25,000 other fishing fans over there. And our whole goal is to save you time by putting you in that 90-10 zone and then saving you money uh, by one, recommending the best tackle, and then two, giving it to you at up to 20% off everything in our store. And then Deeks, you got another course. Every year Deeks is working on kind of one big course. You've been working on this one for probably 18 months, just getting little pieces here and there. Can you give a, a quick little teaser about uh, the, the next course coming out? Well, this is one that I, it's just something that I think is, would be really cool for everybody to see it'll teach you a lot about fish but it's it's how game fish naturally behave in the water and you can see it and and once you see how these fish like respond to a beta lure or just swim on their own in the water what they look like undisturbed which is so hard to capture because you know you're like strapping yourself to a piling sitting there for hours or gopros on rocks and jetties and things like that but i know for myself if i like you know i don't want to digress here but you pull up to a rock jetty and you look at it and you're like, well, the fish are near the rocks, but how are they against the rocks? What are they doing down there? Maybe they're not against the rocks, but like if you could swim down there and see like actually how they set up more often than not, they're not how you think. But if you know what they're doing, you can apply that to where you fish and it's going to make you a much better angler. So that's of course what we're working on. It's just going to be a lot of video clips of fish underwater doing what they naturally do, not in an environment like Robbie's and Island Marotta, but it's going to be it's going to be the real deal stuff. And it's been very challenging, but we've got some really cool stuff and, um, you know, trying to get out as fast as we can. And I'm excited about it. Yeah. It's, it's going to be next level. I mean, that's, that's the ultimate way to study besides just taking biology courses all day long, but that's the ultimate way to see them in their habitat and how they react. Uh, I'm, I'm pumped. I can't wait for everybody to see that one. So once again, that'll be there at saltstrong.com. Our VIP members will get full access to it right away. And uh, if you guys, once again, haven't joined us, this is your chance. Go there today, saltstrong.com. Join the club. You see more Captain Peter Deeks. And uh, brother, we'll definitely have to do another round of this. I would love all of you to go to saltstrong.com and under the fishing tip section, see this blog post and leave a, leave a comment or leave just a papow uh, for uh, Captain Deeks, Deeks if you like this one. And any other questions, things, I know there's just so much you can cover, especially for three different species. Uh, because there are a lot of changes, you know, based on uh, on each species and each season. So let us know what you think. Let us know what you want to do on part two of this uh, this episode. 
and uh, we'll go out and uh, and film it and hopefully uh you maybe have different live bait or maybe keep the same ones put it in the in the fridge i'm sure it'll be good cool well, thanks for having me on god bless you guys and good luck out there thanks peter thanks guys we out peace yeah. pal snap